about six months before the crucifixion, Christ took his disciples away from Israel to found a new Israel. It's in Matthew 16 that we read the word church for the first time. <clears throat> this is a marvellous chapter. If you read from about verse 13 onwards, we find the key doctrines of the true Israel, the Church of Christ. The incarnation, the Godhead coming into flesh at Bethlehem. The atonement, God becomes a curse, becomes sin for a wicked world that their guilt may be taken away, the atonement. The resurrection, because our Lord has dealt with sin and Satan, all who believe will rise to everlasting life. So in the last half of this chapter, we read the key words of the New Testament. Christ cross, church, coming. We also in this chapter find the key virtues of believers illustrated. We read about faith and love and hope. I'm going to read to you from verse 13 of Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, What do you say? Who do you say? I am. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. Flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of death will not overcome it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Well, what does all this mean? Well, we must understand the real nature of the man of Nazareth. Peter says, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you are the one prophesied in scores of verses in the Old Testament. You were foretold by Isaiah, by the Psalmist, by Daniel. You are the promised Redeemer of the world who would take away the guilt of all men and women by an atoning death. You are the Messiah and the Messiah is divine. You are the Son of the living God. You are God the Son. And Christ says, Blessed art thou, Simon. You couldn't work this out by yourself. God has told you. And it's true. And then he says, You're Peter. Now Peter means a piece of rock or rolling stone. And this verse has been very controversial. I give you an opinion. You are Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of death shall not prevail against it. You are Peter, you are the first stone of the church to be laid. The church of course is built on God. In the Old Testament 
the word rock is never used for a human being but it's often used for God. In the New Testament we read other foundation can no one lay than what is laid, Jesus Christ. In the New Testament he's called the cornerstone of the church, the capstone of the church. There are two Greek words here. Peter comes from Petros, which means a piece of rock, stone. But when Jesus says upon this rock, he uses a different word, Petra, which means a huge mass of rock. Where they were was rocky. Many temples had been built there. Huge chunks of rocks surrounded the disciples and Jesus as they talked. And Jesus is saying, Peter, you're the first stone to be laid on me, the foundation of the new church, the new Israel. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. In chapter 18, the same keys are given to all the disciples. The keys represent the word of God, the gospel, which when rightly preached, releases people from guilt, from condemnation, from everlasting loss and binds the unbeliever to be lost forever for they reject the good news and they spit in the face of God who loves them. Then it says from that time forth Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law. That he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. Lord, <clears throat> This will never happen to you. And then from the mouth of Christ come perhaps the most severe words he ever spoke. Get you behind me, Satan. You are an offence to me. You don't mind the things of heaven, but the things of earth. Probably you're speaking to Satan who was behind Peter. But Peter was following in the wake of Satan by trying to prevent the cross by which we are all saved. So Christ is very strong. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I'm reading verse 24, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his life? What can man give in exchange for his life? And so our Lord is telling the disciples they must follow in his path of self-denial. They must be prepared to give up all the world offers to be his true disciples. But this is very hard for the disciples to take. They've been taught otherwise about the Messiah. They've been taught the Messiah would free Israel from the Romans, that he'd restore rulership to the Jews. And now Christ was talking about crucifixion. They found that very, very hard to take. But Christ adds a warning and then a remarkable promise. Let me read to you. The Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels and then he'll reward each person according to what he's done. I tell you the truth. 
Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, how does one explain that? Well, take the warning first. He's saying that the second advent will be judgment day. And John 5, 22 says, Christ is the judge of all men, not the Father, but he who has humanity. So here in chapter 16 of Matthew, he foretells the second advent and says accompanying the advent will be the judgment of all who've ever lived according to how they've lived. But then there's this promise, this strange promise over which people have argued for millennia. Verily I say unto you, some are standing here who won't, won't taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What on earth does that mean? Well, before I give you an answer, we must read the next verses in chapter 17. There have been six days of gloom and fear and doubt on the part of the disciples. What was this all about? The Messiah being crucified. But then this happened. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James and John, the brother of James, led them up to a high mountain by themselves. So he left nine disciples behind. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And in Luke's gospel is they talked about his exodus. Now of course that word first of all meant Israel fleeing from Egypt through the desert to the promised land. That was the exodus. But Jesus was to have an exodus. He was to go to Jerusalem, followed by disciples so puzzled they hardly talked at all, bewildered. That was Christ's exodus. Then there was his exodus from life itself as he died on the cross. So this is what Moses and Elijah talked about. And the disciples who'd fallen asleep while praying wake up. They see Jesus shining like the sun in sublime majesty. His garment white as the light. And there is Moses whom he addresses by name. And Elijah who he calls by name. And they're talking about his death. The same thing that had discouraged the disciple six days before. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, <clears throat> a bright cloud enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now what was this all about? You know, only things apart from Jesus saw this event and apart from Moses and Elijah. You'd expect the New Testament to be full of it. The majestic Christ shining like the sun, his clothes glistering and gleaming, and Moses of the law, the head of the law, Elijah the head of the prophets, they appear. Everyone thought they were gone. And they talked to Jesus of his exodus, his coming death. Why isn't the New Testament full of this? Why isn't it over and over in the epistles of Paul? 
Jesus said to the disciples, don't tell anybody about this until I'm risen from the dead. Not long after that, James was executed. He couldn't talk about it. But the other two did briefly refer to this event. Peter, in one of his epistles, talks about when he's with Christ in the Holy Mount. And John says in the first chapter of his Gospel, we beheld his glory. So what's the meaning of the transfiguration? Well, first of all, it was to strengthen Christ himself. He was on his way to death. Moses says, don't give up. Elijah says, keep on going. And God gives his endorsement. This is my beloved son. So first of all, Christ is encouraged for what is to come very soon. But secondly, and this is very important, the disciples who for six days had been gloomy and discouraged, wondering about what Jesus had said about Calvary. Now they see the majesty of Christ, his face as the sun, his garments white as the light, and Moses the head of the law, and Elijah the head of the prophets, they're there and they're encouraging Jesus and they're talking about his death. This is something he must do, must not give up. And then God endorses us all. It was like a miniature second coming. When Christ comes a second time, he'll be in majesty and he'll be with the Father, he'll be with the angels. This was very much like the second advent promised to them at the end of the discussion on Caesarea Philippi. But there would be more fulfilments of that promise. When Christ died on the cross and the heavens were blackened and the rocks were riven and the veil was torn in the temple and the ground shook and many of the saints arose and went into Jerusalem. That was very much like the second advent when heaven and earth will shake and our Lord will return to raise the dead. But further, at Pentecost, when Peter spoke, thousands were converted. The church was built beautifully by thousands of people leaving Judaism. That was like the kingdom of God coming in power, which is the way Mark puts the promise in chapter 9 and verse 1. Some standing here, one taste of death till they see the coming of the kingdom of God in power. Well, that happened at Pentecost when thousands were converted. But the chief fulfillment is in AD 70. Remember Christ said, some here won't taste of death. Well, by AD 70, Several of the disciples were dead. Few were still alive. And they saw the day of God's judgment. They saw the day of the Lord when God destroyed the temple and destroyed Jerusalem so that the world would be taught by the new Israel, the disciples of Christ. That event in AD 70 was a preview of the second advent when Christ will come in glory to punish the wicked and to redeem his people. I commend to you these two chapters. If you understand chapter 16, you'll understand about the incarnation, the atonement, the resurrection, if you understand those four key words, Christ, Church, Cross, Coming, you'll have the heart of theology. And if you see how Christ exhorted the disciples to have faith and love and hope 
you'll know what it is to be a Christian. And if you read often the story of the transfiguration, your faith will be strengthened in the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the certainty of his return to this world to raise the dead and to judge all who have ever lived. I commend to you these two chapters, Matthew 16 and 17. God bless you.